get enough to drink this morning, so hopefully I'll have enough water before the end of the service. My throat is not where it should be this morning. I don't know why, but it's just not there. So I'm going to get through this because I'm talking about surviving the storms of life today. So we're going to look at this. How many of us have ever had a problem? <laughs> Why don't you not raise your hands? I'm going to talk to every one of you because i got to figure out your secret. I would imagine every one of us have went through some storms in our life. And I hate to say it, we're not going through one now, just wait a while. They hit everybody at random times, in random degrees, and um, it's amazing. Um, when you look back at your storms, I have found that in my faith has grown more through the storms than through the joys. I hate to say that, but it's true. Um, you learn a lot when you're down and out, or you should learn a lot. Some people never learn. The Lord wants us to learn, and he's there with us to teach us if we want to learn. There was a report titled Surviving and Thriving in the 21st Century. It was published um, by the Commission for Human Future. And they went ahead and you can find this online, but I just thought I'd bring it to you to find out what is the world concerned about? What's their storms that they're fearing, I guess you'd say? Here's the top ten. Let's mention them real quick. Decline of natural resources, particularly water. Collapse of ecosystems and loss of biodiversity. That's a big thing. Human population growth beyond the Earth's carrying capacity. Global warming and human-induced climate change. Chemical pollution of the Earth system, including the atmosphere and oceans. Rising food insecurity and failing nutritional quality. Nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, pandemics of new and untreatable diseases, the advent of power, powerful, uncontrolled new technology, and national and global but national and global failure to understand and act preventatively on these risks. I look at this list and I say, really, in the last, I guess, in the last. Several years, I haven't really thought seriously about any of these things. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but I really don't walk around thinking about, I'm afraid of new technology, or I'm afraid of this or afraid of that. I'm not saying there's not some legitimacy in some of these concerns, but it's not overwhelming me to where there's a storm in my life, but these are what people were fearing. These are causing them grief and anxiety. I think the storms we all face can be can subcategorized in something like this, political concerns. How many of us see political uprisings in this country that you shake your head and say, what is going on? And I've always told you, as long as I've been your pastor here, that really our, our answer is not in the elephant or in the donkey, but it's in the lamb. Our, our problems are not solved at the White House, but at the church house. I really believe that. Not that we shouldn't be somehow concerned about our politics, but it shouldn't consume us to the point of, of fear and nervousness. Economic concerns, we've all been hit hard. With economic, everything's higher now. And most of us, our increases in pay do not meet economic inflation, financial concerns, morality concerns. I mean, what's right and wrong anymore? I just read an article where this year, during the double wars, which is basically the Christian form of the Grammys. Well, they decided that they were gonna become woke too, and they had a drag queen show up and receive an award. Yeah, we can't even keep them sacred anymore. There's, there, is there any right and wrong anymore? We know the answer to that question. The answer is yes, there is. But the line is so blurred in our culture. We have those concerns. 
family concerns, this affects our family. We're trying to teach our kids one thing at the home and they go to the school and they're taught something totally different and if parents get involved and want to pull their children out of that, then they get in trouble. Global concerns, I've mentioned that. Some people are concerned about what's going on and we're going to burn the globe up and Environmental concerns, health concerns, 2020 brought that to all of our attention. And this produces emotional concerns. And then we all have our own personal concerns that affect just us. To top it all off, we're then bombarded 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the radio, TV, and internet about all these concerns. We have become overwhelmed with bad news. And sometimes we feel like Elijah in 1 Kings 18, 22, where he asked this question, am I the only righteous one left? Am I the only one that cares? Am I the only one that has common sense anymore? It's because common sense isn't too common anymore. We used to know what a woman and a man was. We just had a Supreme Court justice put in our Supreme Court that couldn't answer that simple question. What is a woman? This is how messed up we are. But we have a God. That is the cure. And we have his word that tells us his, the answer. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Start at verse 24. I don't know why I put 21 there. That's my problem. It should be 24. Matthew 24 through 29. It says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock, though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. Anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. We read that scripture and we say, praise God for that promise. That if we build our house on the rock, we can survive these storms. But I, like you, have been through a storm on occasion to where I felt that my rock was crumbling. Sometimes we say, Lord, why am I going through this? And I need you now. I, I can't wait. I need you now. And sometimes we feel our prayers are hitting the ceiling. And these effects, the effect this can have on us are, are many facets that you have in your notes there. What kind of, what kind of, what effect can these storms have on our life? Well, First of all, it makes us mad. Sometimes we get mad. The Psalms are written with precatory prayers from, from, the, from the writer David, from King David, how he was angry to the point he would pray angry prayers. Lord, why are these people doing this to me? I wish you would just knock out all their teeth. It's in there. Read it. You'll see it. He gets so angry that the wicked are flourishing and the righteous are suffering. And he asked that question, why do the wicked prosper? Sometimes it makes us angry. Sometimes it makes us fearful for what's to come. Because we don't know what's going to come. We don't know what's going to happen in five seconds from now. Sometimes it leads to depression. But pastor Christians shouldn't be depressed people. Well, 
have a couple sermon series on that I can share with you. Depression has nothing to do with your faith in God. It's so much it has to do with the chemicals in your brain and your personality makeup. But I can say that if you want to look in Scripture and really study, you'll find out that Moses, Job, Jonah, Elijah, David, and Jeremiah all suffered with depression. Just read it with an open mind. I've had people say, Christian counseling, there's no such thing. If you put your faith in God, you should never need Christian counseling. Well, that's like going up to a diabetic and say, if you have faith in God, don't take your insulin shot tomorrow. I don't buy all that stuff. I think good Christian counseling is needed in the church. I don't see where there's a lot of scriptures here talk about getting the advice of counselors. That very word used in here several times. And if we're not angry, fearful, or depressed, sometimes storms will leave us confused. And the main question we have when we go through a storm in life is we say, why? I've been asked that question several times. This doesn't make sense, God. If you just let me be God for a few minutes, I'll straighten all this out. I must say, there have been things in my life that I've had happen, and I don't know why until several years later. And somebody will come up to me, and say, you know, I'm having this problem. And I'll say, you know something? There was a time in my life I went through that same thing. You ever had this happen, Jerry? It happens. Let me tell you what I did and how God worked me through this problem. And we're a blessing because of a problem. I'm not saying that's always the reason why we go through it, but God can make something good out of something that was bad. We can make a ministry out of our misery if we allow him to. But when we're going through it, I'm not trying to brush a broad stroke here saying it's all going to be fine and dandy and you're going to be happy all the time you're going through it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that at the end, I have seen where God has protected me when the whole time I was going through that problem and saying, God, you've got to get me out of this. He was, he was there protecting me. It's just I didn't like it. I'm not a person that likes pain very much. I'm a sissy when it comes to pain. I can take, I can take pain. It's just I don't enjoy it. I know some people that like a good fight. I do. They just, when they have stress, they, they, do, they seem like do their best work under stress. I'm not that way. But what can we do according to this verse to help us to survive these life storms? Well, first of all, we can see here from this scripture, if you read it and keep reading it, you're going to find out that making sure we have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Make sure our life is built on who? Jesus, the rock. He is our rock. He's the cornerstone. Make sure our life is built on Him. See, we can build on other things. We can build it on our family. We can build it on our job. Build it on our friends. Build it on our spouse. Build it on our money. Whatever you want to build it on, go ahead. Build that sand. We need to build it on Jesus Christ. That's the rock. You have to do that. There's two things under this point that I put in your notes. Our genuineness is founded in experiencing a new birth. In Jesus Christ. Our genuineness is founded in experiencing a new birth in Jesus Christ. We have to give our life to Jesus Christ. If we want to overcome sin in this world. The second thing under that point. Our genuineness is evidenced by doing the will of God. It's founded in experiencing a new life in Christ. But it's evidenced by doing the will of God. A lot of us stop there. We say, well, when I was 13, I remember I went to a youth event and 
and I gave my heart to Christ and, and it was good for about six months and so I think I'm saved. I think. I haven't read the word much. I haven't been to church very much for the last 10, 20 years. But, and then they wonder why their life isn't victorious because they put doing the will of God on the back burner. James tells us that we need not just be hearers of the word, but we need to be doers of it. According to this scripture, it's the person who does it that is blessed, who builds their life on the rock that's secure. Not somebody just hears about it. I can hear all I want about building a building on sand and a solid foundation, but if I don't do that, what's going to happen to my building? It's going to collapse. So that's the first thing we have to do. Build our life on the rock, Jesus Christ. The second thing, committing ourselves to not only hear God's word, but also heed its advice. To heed its advice. Those that hear it and do not heed it are like sand or foolish. They know exactly what they should do. They're told, they, they read it, they hear it, they hear it preached, they, they might even have memorized it. But when it comes down to it, they do not do it. How much victory is in that practice? According to this, we're called foolish. We're building our house on sand if we do that. We need to hear it and then heed his message. That's building your life on the rock. It's not always easy. I must say, when I was a youth, which was a long time ago, I understand what youth go through from my perspective, because I'm not a youth in the 21st century. I was a youth way back in that old 20th century. Back in the 80s and 70s, you probably, yeah, you weren't even twinkling your parents' eye yet, but you know something? I remember the pressures then. I had to make some decisions that were unpopular according to my friends and culture. Decisions that were hard to make. It would have been easier just to go ahead and follow my flesh and not worry about following the word of God. But it, there's not one decision I've made for Jesus Christ that I regret. All that stuff that I didn't do, the culture told me to do, and pressured me into doing, I would have regretted every one of those decisions in some way. But I don't regret it now. I chose to do it. Did I mess up and make mistakes? I sure did. Made some bad decisions. Yes. And yeah, I found something else out too. These kind of pressures, young people, do not end when you become old. They just change their form. Instead of having problems with peers, you have problems at work and problems with family. It's called adulting. And they don't leave, but our bedrock, our faith stays the same. It's this right here. That stays the same. Our pressures change, but our solution stays the same. If you learn that at a young age, it'll save you a whole lot of problems. We have a lot of people here that will support you if you're going through a problem with a decision. Every person that's been is older than you have been where you want where you are. They once were where you are. The next point is realizing that the storms of life affect everyone. It says in Matthew 5, 45, that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So the storms fall on everyone. But we don't like it when it falls on Christians. Hey, I'm trying to live for you and you're giving me all this problems. That comes from a theory that we don't believe here. The words preaches. The word don't preach that all Christians just have this wonderful life and never have problems. I don't see it spoken in this word at all. Now there is some preachers preaching that message. I'm not one of them. 
because I don't see it in the Word of God. Even Jesus Christ, he was, he was crucified for doing no wrong. Illegally hung on a cross. He broke no laws. In fact, Scripture says he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He wasn't wealthy. He went through horrible physical turmoil. Look at the disciples in Scripture. Every disciple that followed Jesus Christ was martyred but John the Apostle. They tried to martyr him. They tried to boil him in oil, and God protected him. And so they said, well, we can't kill him doing this. We'll send him to the Isle of Patmos. And there he wrote the scriptures. The one scripture we know is the Revelation. I don't know how people can read scripture and say, well, God's people don't suffer. If you just read the history of the disciples, you'll see how much they suffered. Peter got to the end of his life, but he, they were going to crucify him. He said, I'll tell you what, I don't want to be crucified like my Savior. Crucify me upside down. So that's the way he died. But Christians, they don't suffer. Well, I can't see that in Scripture. Their rain falls on the just and the unjust. Now, you're going to come up to a pastor or a Christian person and say, why is this happening to me? I'm going to tell you right up front my answer. It's real easy to answer. I don't know. I know you pay my salary to be your answer man. But there are certain questions in life that I don't know. And I do not know the mind of God. And scripture says that who has known the mind of God? Now we can have the mind of Christ to know to do his will. But to understand God's sovereignty is beyond this mind. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to you in time. But when you're going through it, just hang on for dear life to this. And to in confidence in the faith. So you get to the other side. The last point, understanding that these storms can and will destroy us if our lives are not built on God's word. So we make sure we have a relationship with God. We commit ourselves to do the will of God. We realize that the storms affect everyone. And finally, we can get to the point to understand that these storms can and will destroy us if they are not, if our lives aren't built on His Word. There's so many people try to use other forms of coping in life other than God's Word. And they come up so short to giving us the peace that we need. Jesus is the prince of what? Peace. Drugs are not. Budweiser isn't. Pornography isn't. Sex isn't. There's nothing is the prince of peace. Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. We want peace in our life? We're going to be talking a lot about the prince of peace here few weeks, believe it or not, Advent starts not too long away. Me and Jerry were just talking about that. You believe the end of 2023 is almost here. Now, I used to hear when I was a young person, people used to say, boy, time sure does fly when you get older. I used to say, what, it's still 365 days a year. How can time fly? I got it down now. I know exactly what they're saying. When I was a when I was a young parent in my 20s, I had a baby, and I used to raise these boys. Man, there were times the days were long. Just get me through this day. Please. I was told the days are long, but the years are short, and it's so true. think to myself, where does time, where is time gone? I don't know where it's went, but it's, it's out there somewhere. It just keeps flying by. And I have to ask myself all the time, Lord, as I live these fast-paced days, and I slow down to make sure my anchor is in you. It's not a matter of if I'm going to go through a problem in the future. I'm going to. And 
and so are you. The question is, when and what? But we are assured that God will never leave us or forsake us. And if we hang in there with him and keep that communication open with him, he'll bring us through that storm. We might not like it. We might not understand it. We might even get mad at God while we're going through it. And God has big enough shoulders to hear those prayers. If you want to yell at him, go ahead. But don't take your faith somewhere else. Keep your faith in him. We help you through it. You really will. Points to ponder as we leave. God was, God is, and always will be there for us during our storm. These are truths right out of God's word. Deuteronomy 31, 6, Hebrews 13, 5. It'll show you God will never leave us or forsake us. He is, he will be, and always will be, and was. He's, he'll never leave us. He's there. He'll be there with us. The second thing, the destruction done to our lives from the storm is in direct proportion to our application to his word during the storm. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes we cause some of our storms. And we can make the storm worse or better by how we respond. Here's the way I've seen it in life. I have a little years behind me now. I never used to view this 20 or 30 years ago because I was still considered a young buck. Now I'm 59, so I'm not quite as young as I used to be. I do have some life experience. I have found that we tend to want problems to end quick. And sometimes by going through the fire, it refines us to a point to where we're better on the opposite end. But we don't like the heat of the fire. And so what we need to do um, is just try to rest in God knowing that I don't like this and I wish I could get out of it some way. So here's the danger. I put in there the destruction done to our lives from the storms in direct proportion to our application. So sometimes we get a little into the storm and we just abandon everything we know that's right. If this is the way God treats his child, then I'm out of here. You ever heard people say that? We all have. Maybe we say it in anger. And God is grieving when you do that. Because he has you right here. In the palm of his hand. And we say, I don't want to be there anymore. I'm just going to do everything the word tells me not to do. And then the storm gets worse. And then we say, see, I told you, God, I'm your child. Look, it just keeps getting worse because we've done what? Our destruction is in proportion to what we know and what we do concerning the word of God. If we hold fast to him and keep his promises in this word and do the best we can to hold on, the storm won't be as bad. It won't be good, but it won't be as bad. But sometimes we can add on to the misery by relying on sand instead of the word. Just remember that. The third thing, third point, the level of commitment I have and maintain with God throughout the storm is determined by us. When we're going through it, we determine our fate in a sense. We determine it, how much pain we're going to put on ourselves. People that constantly keep making the same bad decision over and over and over and over again. And they say, this time it's going to be different. No, it's not. It's not. If you keep making a bad decision, keep getting a bad result, you need to change your decision. Sometimes we cause 
for the level of commitment I have and maintain with God throughout the storm is determined by us. Are we going to hang on to the rock or are we going to step on the sand and hope it doesn't sink this time? And last, God's word needs to be the main source of strength and support through life's various storms. <clears throat> I know that sounds like a cliche, cliche I want to say this word, cliche, and a pastoral thing to say by saying, I just rely on the word. You know something? It's so true. There's power in that statement. We can put our faith in the whims of man, have a bumper sticker mentality. Oh, I like that bumper sticker. I think I'll live by that one. Oh, go ahead. You'll get a bumper stick faith. You as well. You'll get bumped all around life. There are some bumper stickers out there that are cute, but I surely wouldn't want to live by their motto. A lot of memes you see on, on the internet, a lot of funnies out there, and trust me, I laugh at a lot of them. But, man, if you live by their rules, you are in for a world of hurt. There's a lot of times we want to do things different. People mess us up. We want to show them who's boss. Just remember, there was one time when probably somebody wanted to show you that they were boss because you were messing with them and they didn't and they had grace. You appreciate and you receive it. So therefore, if we really reap what we sow, then we need to initiate grace. Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing. But doing the right thing is never wrong. Even when we're going through the storm. Let us pray.